continuing with the series on Project 316. Last week, we spoke on For God, and today we speak on the wonderful subject, So Loved. And I want to submit to you, my friend, that it would take an ocean of ink and skies made of parchment and every stalk on this earth a quill to even begin to describe the love of God. And even at that point, I would tell you that the ocean of ink and the sky of parchment would not be sufficient to be able to tell us totally about the love of God. We can't even begin today. Charles Spurgeon, that great British preacher, he commented on the word so in for God so loved. And he said this, come ye surveyors, bring your chains and try to make a survey of this word so. Nay, that is not enough. Come hither ye that make our national surveys and lay down charts for all nations. Come ye who map the sea and land and make a chart of this word so. Nay, I must go further. Come hither ye astronomers, that with your optic glasses spy out spaces before which imagination staggers. Come hither and encounter calculations worthy of all your powers. When ye have measured between the horns and space, here is a task that will defy you. God so loved the world. God so loved the world. It's beyond our imagination. We can't even begin to comprehend how God could so love this world. I like the way the Apostle Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 3. Paul's prayer was that we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Friend, Paul's desire was that we would know the breadth, the length, the depth, the height, the love of Christ, the love of God. That was his desire. And as we think about these two words today in this sermon, as we preached on for God last week, this week so loved. As we think of those two words, let's consider the breadth, the length, the depth, the height of God's love. First of all today, the height of God's love is that it has no comparison. The height of God's love, it has no comparison. When I look up the word love in the dictionary, I find this, dic this definition. A strong affection for another rising out of kinship are personal ties. S.D. Gordon says about love, love is the tender, strong outgoing of your whole being to another. It is passion burning like a fire within you, a soft burning but intense fire within you for some other one. Another one is written, love is a fabric that never fades, no matter how often it is washed in the water of adversity and of grief. It's a pretty good definition. Someone else said love doesn't consist of holding hands, it consists of holding hearts. I like that statement too. And we could go on and on with a quote. I've read tons of them. Uh, uh, sharing quote after quote of the definitions of the love of God. But let me just, let me just end with this one more definition by F.B. Meyer, that great old preacher of day gone by, that said, you can no more define the essence of love than you can define the essence of God, but you can define its effect in fruits. And I, I like that statement that he makes. It is true that love is difficult to define, but it's easier to demonstrate. And when I think about that, I can't help but think about the demonstration of human love. Several, there are so many that we could think about, but only three that I would make mention of today. I think of a mother's love. We know the words of Kipling that said, if I were hanged on the highest tree, I know whose love would follow me still. Mother of mine, oh mother of mine. If I were drowned in the deepest sea, I know whose tears would come down to me, mother of mine, oh mother of mine. If I were damned of body and soul, I know whose prayer would make me whole, mother of mine, oh mother of mine. And so I would say to you today that there may be no greater demonstration of love in the, this world, I'm talking about human love than the, the love of a mother, a mother's love. A mother loves unconditionally and unceasingly, that's a mother. 
But what about a father's love? We find that Addison said, certain it is that there is no kind of affection so purely angelic as the love of a father to a, da to a daughter. And so we see a, a father's love. But what about the spouse's love? Surely there can be no deeper love than a love that is shared between a man and a woman. Those are types of, of human love. But I want you to go on today past that when we're talking about the demonstration of love and look at the heavenly love, the demonstration of heavenly love. And when I think about a mother's love and a father's love or a spouse's love, I'm reminded, my friend, that as deep as those loves are, they can't even, they can't even be used as a measuring stick for God's love because God's love transcends and it surpasses all human love, any love that might be demonstrated to us in this world. Try as we may, try as people may, we can find no earthly illustration of, of the love God has for each of us today. The height of his love is that it has no comparison. There is no comparison. How much, does God love, God, how much does God love us? God's love surpasses the love of a mother. God's love surpasses the love of a father. God's love surpasses the love of a spouse. God so loved, and there is no comparison to, to the love of God. But I want you to see also the depth of God's love is that it has no conditions. What a wonderful thing. It has no conditions. When people think about love, they, they often think of it in the human context. Is that not true? They often think of it that way. However, it is important for us to understand two things today. Number one, man's love is uncertain. Is that not true? Man's love is uncertain. I heard about a, a lady who owned and operated a, a, a nursery or a daycare center for children and this lady said that one day uh, someone brought in a four-year-old girl into the nursery there to the daycare. And this little girl was different from all the other girls. She was born in prison. Her mother was incarcerated for drugs and she had taken drugs all throughout her pregnancy. And as a result of this, this little baby was known as being born as a crack baby. What a sad situation it was. She had many, many problems. The little girl had a lot of fears and she never spoke to any of the people in the nursery. They never heard ever a word ever come out of her mouth. And she would go while she was there into these fits of rage um, while they were in, she was in their care. And they brought the little girl in, the lady that owned the nursery immediately took a liking to her, this little one that to most people was unlove, uh, unlovely and perhaps unlovable in the sight of many people because of the way that, that she acted. But when the little girl had these tremendous fits, this woman that ran the nursery loved this little girl, took such great interest into her that she would take her back into her arms and take her back into her office there where she had a rocking chair. And she would sit back there with that little girl in her arms and she'd begin rocking her and she'd sing that little song to her, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. And she, she would rock that little girl and it, it seemed to help her somewhat. But you know what? Day after day, week after week, month after month passed and she, this lady running the place, began to notice a change in the little girl. She had began to change and she was not as extremely bad with her fits and fears that she had been uh, having. One day she had a bad day, it was a particularly bad day, and she picked her up, put her arms, went back in her office to, to sit there with her, and she's rocking her. Little girl had uh, tears in her eyes and looked up at the lady, and she said the very first word she'd ever said to them. Sing to me about the man who loves me. That's what she wanted. You see, man's love can fail you. 
But the love of Jesus makes a difference in this world. He made a difference in our lives, did he not? That day that he saved us, he loved us so much. So often our love is motivated, inspired by the love that we receive from others. Is that not true? It is. So often our love is a, a matter of, of a re, reciprocation. In fact, our, our love for Christ is motivated by the fact that he loved us. That's what 1 John four nineteen says, we love him because he first loved us. So our love often has conditions. Our conditions often is that we love them because they loved us, or furthermore, we love those that are desirable, or those that are deserving, perhaps. Certain features, qualities, virtues, they, they all call out our love, as well as the absence of sub, such things that, that keeps us from loving. So you see, again, I want you to think of the love of God. I want you to think about his love for us. There is, so, there is so much about him that calls out our love and attracts our love. I would say to you, when you think about God, it is not so much why anyone could love him, but why could they not love him? Why could anybody in this world not love the Lord Jesus Christ? After all that he has done for us. But I want you to go on and see God's love is unconditional. Man's love may fail us, but God's love is unconditional. And when I think of God's love for us, I'm reminded of the fact that there is nothing uh, in us, uh, there is nothing about us that attracts God's love. You understand that, my friend. We were at, at our best uh, depraved and disgraceful and de de defiled sinners. That was us. That's where we were. The truth is everything about us should make God loathe us instead of making him love us. That is the truth. Uh, why would God love someone like us? But I'm glad that I can tell you that his love is without conditions. Aren't you thankful for that today? That is, his love does not demand that we be a certain kind of person or live a certain kind of life or possess certain kinds of virtues in order for him to love us. God doesn't demand that in order to love us. Not at all. God's love does not require that we be certain things or do certain things. His love is without any conditions today. Understand that today. If you're here and you do not know Jesus Christ, and I hear people all the time that I witness to, well, you know, I'm going to try to straighten some things up in my life. It's almost like that they have to get to a certain point to where they feel like that they can be presentable to God. You don't understand God loves you just the way you are. Now, it doesn't mean that he loves your sin, but God's willing to save you from those sins. He loves you. Deuteronomy 7, verse 7 and 8. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people for you were fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you. I don't understand why. I can't comprehend it. All I know is that he loved me. And that's what he says here in Deuteronomy is uh, they were trying to give explanations why God loved them, but he, he says here he loved you because he loved you. That's the reason why. The Lord loves us because he loves us. That's unconditional love. You do not have to be lovable in order to be loved of God. Neither do you have to be desirable or commendable or presentable. Because the Bible tells us in Romans 5, 8, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, my friend, even when we were sinners, God loved us. Praise the Lord that he loved us like that. When Nason was looking for the North Pole, his ship entered into deep waters. And each day he gathered up the rope and let down the plummet to measure the depth of the ocean at any given post that he was at. And one day he came to a place to where the water was exceptionally deep. And it is told that he let down the plummet, but he could not sound the depth. And so he gathered every available uh, rope on board the ship and to attach it to the line. And still, the, it was deeper than, than uh, any rope that he had. So in his report, 
He wrote the exact length of the line that he had. And then he wrote after that, deeper than that. And I like that. I like that story because I'll tell you, when we think about the depths of the love of God, we are reminded that we were sinners, but God's love goes deeper than that. You say, well, I'm too bad of a sinner. I'm here to tell you God's love goes deeper than that. Many have sunk in the quagmire of sin, in the depths of depravity, but God, praise God, his love goes deeper than that. He will save any man from their sins. Third of all, I want you to see the breadth of God's love is that it has no confinements. No confinements. The love, the love of God has no boundaries. No boundaries. There's no confinement, no limits to God's love. In fact, John 3.16 tells us God's love is a whosoever love. Do you see that? That's so, so very important. Whosoever, anybody, I don't care who you are, what you've done, it is a whosoever love. God's love is not limited racially, nationally, politically, socially, personally. It doesn't make any difference. We are told God so loved the world. He loved the world, and his love is without boundary. It is without confinement. As one has said, it reaches behind every prison bar into the slums where men and women live in such filth so vile it would nauseate even the most hardened caseworker. It reaches in the red light district where men and women's bodies have been ravaged by social prostitution. It reaches into the pit of sin where man has fallen lower than beast. It reaches in the death cell where the hardened criminals await their doom. It reaches into the icy huts of Greenland's mountains. It flows into the Orient to water the lives of India's teeming millions, into the lonely jungles of Africa to quicken the soul of the savage Bushmen. God's love is abundant. It's su it supply so inexhaustible that it is above all and for all. I don't know who wrote that, but I like that of what they wrote because it is above all and it is for all. There is nobody, there is nobody that God does not love. God will so love the world. And that is the breath of God's love. Aren't you glad there's no confinements to the love of God that whosoever will may come today. You may come to him if you do not know him and receive him. Then last of all today, I want you to see the length of God's love, that it has no conclusion. Thank God for that. No conclusion. Spurgeon on one occasion, that great preacher visited one of his students uh, that had become a pastor and uh, he had built a new church building. And on this church building, it had a tower and it had a weather vane there that the words on it, God is love. I'd like to find a weather vane like that. I'm gonna have to ask the American pickers to find me one of those. And uh, surely they find all those weather vanes out there. But God is love is what he had on the weather vane there. Spurgeon came and said to his young man, he said, young man, do you think God's love is as changeable as the wind? Thank God for that young man. He's probably ready for what Spurgeon question he had to ask. And the student said, no, sir. But the message is God is love no matter which the way the wind blows. That was one time the student got up on, on, the, on the teacher. And uh, of course, Spurgeon said, you are right. God always loves. And he does. There's no conclusion, friend. God said in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 3, write that down because you ought to memorize that verse. Jeremiah 31, 3, yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. That's our God. No matter what, he continues to love us. When we fail this week, and I pray to God that we don't, but when we do, uh, he still loves us. No matter how far down we've gone, no matter what situation that we're in, that we're facing, our God still loves us because he declares in his word that he loves us with an everlasting love. God's love is an everlasting love. You can go back as far as you wish into eternity past, and I promise you, you will not find a moment that our God does not love us. You can go as far as you want to into eternity 
uh, future as you wish, but I promise you, you will never find a moment that our God will not love us. He loves us. There will never be a time in our lifetime or in eternal lifetime of God that God does not love us. He loves us. R.L. Moyer said it this way. You may go back beyond the time when a wave beat upon the beach or a star shone in the sky of the, the lee or a leaf of the tree fluttering, fluttered in the breeze or an angel worship before the throne. And when you get back as far as the mind can reach, you will be no near the beginning of God's love for you than you are now. If you project your mind into the future to the time when the mountains have molded down into dust are out beyond the time when the sun has grown cold and the stars are old and the leaves of the judgment book unfold, you will be no nearer the end of God's love than you are right now. R.L. Moyer said it right, my friend. It doesn't make any difference how far in the past you go and how far in the future that you go. You will never outrun, ever outknow the love of God because it has no conclusion. The songwriter says his love has no limits. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto man. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth, he giveth, and giveth again. That's our Lord. And we are loved by God. And I'm glad I can tell you that we will always be loved by God. His love has no conclusion. It is an unending love for God so loved. One time a census taker asked a mother at her front door how many children she had. Well, she responded, she said, well, there's Billy and there's Harry and there's Martha. And the man said, never mind the names, he interrupted. He said, just give me the number. And the woman said, sir, they haven't got numbers, they've all got names. Well, Red, I want you to know, that's the way it is in our relationship with God. God knows every one of us by name. And he loves every one of us. He even knows the hairs on our head by number. That's how much he cares about us. Paul's writing to Timothy, gave an assuring word that the Lord knoweth them that are his. 